Hello everyone, I'm Fabio, lead machine learning engineer at Graphova, and today I'm going to show you our temporal graph analysis. Uh, graph never stands still, they continuously evolve over time, right? And well, when we can capture the time in our data model, how we can really uh, analyze this temporal evolution? We want to know what is going on into our graph, right? Where the graph is changing, where it's not changing, if there are trends that we can use to make prediction, or we can detect interesting pattern. In, in general, we want to know if we can get useful insight of, out of this graph evolution. So to answer this question, let's start from the data. We analyze this COVID-19 COVID data set. It's a um, collection of, of updated um, scientific publication about COVID-19. And this is a pretty interesting uh, data set because a lot of things actually has happened in a relatively short amount of time. So it's interesting to, to have a look on it from a temporal perspective. When you ingest the data, the COVID-19 data set, you get more or less this kind of, of, of graph or knowledge graph. We are interested mostly on this central part. So let's have a look on what we have here. Okay, down here we have papers, which represent, which are nodes that are representing, you know, the scientific publication. They get published continuously over our temporal line, so we get a, a track of it in this published time property. Up here, we have another type of node, which is the author keywords. The author keywords are keywords showed by, uh, chosen by the author to best reflect the content of the document. This is the definition. We are interesting about that because, you know, with other keywords, we can get the, uh, the, you know, the understanding of the author of their own work, right? But what does it mean? It means that if we have a paper then mentioning two outdoor keywords, it means that at least the author believes that these two topics are, are relevant together, right? They are actually making, making a work, a scientific work about that. But if at the same time we have other paper that are doing the same thing, well, it means that, you know, there is some agreement. But since again, the paper get published continuously, you know, the size of this agreement may change over time, can grow or shrink. Yeah, that's exactly what we are after. We want to get, you know, how the scientific community, scientific community understand about these COVID related topics and how this understanding is evolving over time, right? Through the, the discovery that we, that we made down the road. But let's get concrete, right? In this example, we have a couple of, uh, um, of topics that are relevant together because at least one paper is trying to do risk mitigation using uh, big data analytics, right? But while we have for, for big data analytics, we at least have many other papers that mention it for infection, disease risk mitigation. This is the only one paper we get on the old data set, right? Mentioning it. So one more question, are they really relevant together or not? If we look closely on the data set, we may see that we have other keywords that really are capturing the same content. You see here missing infectious, here we have an extra dash, but we basically capture really the same concept. And we would like them to get connected, you know, and this relationship here actually do exist, not because of the data that we ingested, but because of the meaning of this keyword. We don't want to lose this connectivity when we do our analysis, right? Yeah, but this brings us to the huge topic of how one could cluster keywords in a knowledge graph, right? But luckily, two colleagues of mine actually had a talk about that. And so I will suggest you warmly to uh, watch the record if you didn't attend, right? In the meanwhile, I suppose that we uh, follow the instruction and we had our uh, keyword properly clustered. In this case, that's what we get. Now we have these new uh, green nodes which are representing cluster of keywords, as you can see here, or, or if you want slightly broader concept uh, compared to what you can get to, uh, with a single uh, other keyword, right? But, uh, uh, but I mean, for the rest, it's the same, really, it's the same. We are interested on, you know, the agreement, how the scientific community agrees about these two topics be, uh, being related together, right? To make our life easier, we compute this concurrence graph, it's a pro projection, so at the end of the day, we have only one type of node, the thing that we are interested in, and uh, you know, one, only one type of relationship. And since, again, paper get published continuously, you know, the strength of this relation is also a function of time, right? So with this concurrence graph, we can really start our temporal analysis, so let's dig it. 
the temporal analysis that we are proposing is a, an unsupervised process. And it is composed by three steps. So let's, let's go through all of them one by one. The first thing that we do is to slice the time. We compute the, the, this um, concurrence graph monthly. In, in other words, we select the paper that gets published on the first month, and we compute the first concurrence graph. Then second month, second concurrence graph, and so on. Right? At the end of the day, we have uh, a bunch of uh, graphs which represent uh, snapshots, right? which represent the state of the, of the graph at that moment. Right? On top of this graph, we run this feature extraction algorithm. It's called RefX. It basically gives you a topological feature at different, uh, um, uh, at different levels, uh, different scale. At the end of this process, for every node and for every uh, time step that we have here, we have a vector which is going to describe you know, the structural feature of that node at that point in time. Now, on top of that, finally, we apply this Rolex, this role extraction algorithm, which identify the roles every node is playing within its network, okay? And apply a label on it. Now, it, for us, role is really just, um, you know, a tool to, dis to describe complex behavior in a simple way, in a synthetic way, right? Yeah, I can give you an example. Let's suppose that this network represents an interaction between people in, uh, in a workplace, right? You can imagine that you have many different and complex patterns of interaction. But if you know that this specific node is the boss of the company, for example, well, then it's expected that it's going to interact with other people that are playing some role in turn, right? So the idea is that the role extraction algorithm can learn these roles, what, what, what role do exist in the network, and apply this role to every node, right? With this information now, we can do something very interesting. Is that like keep track or track a node, the same node in different time, uh, time frames and see what happens, what is going on. Is, is the role stable like here or is it going to change, all right? We can spot a pattern, we can get trends, we can do all this kind of, all this kind of stuff to answer to our question. This is a real output that we get. And as you can see here, we have a mixture of role, not just one role. <clears throat> in, this, in this chart, you can see that, for example, uh, the larger the bar, okay, the higher is the impact for that role on that node at that specific point in time, right? So we have a signal here. <clears throat> but before moving on to look at some interesting results, we have to make sense of those roles, right? The process is unsuper an unsupervised one, so we don't have a meaning out of the box. We have to look for it for our, by ourselves. <clears throat> to make our life easier, what we did is to, you know, try to see how, say, role two evolves over time, and how, uh, I don't know, page rank is evolving over time, and see if these two measures are uh, correlated, right? And we do that for different type of graph measure for which we know the meaning, right? And we have this result. And with this result, we learn something. We learn that role zero and role two are actually important role. If you are an important topic in core 19, you are definitely high on role zero and role two, right? On the other end, role three and role four are more peripheral uh, uh, roles. And the role four is slightly better connected, you know, to, to the node that network. But with this in mind, you know, every time a, a node is cross this line, cross the borders, we know that something has happened, right? Something important. So what we can do is to blindly put a threshold here and see what we get. And this is something, it's an example of the, of the output that we get with this technique, right? This is the hydroxychloroquine. Okay, we have to search about that, but at the end of the day, we found out that hydroxychloroquine was something that was thought at the beginning to be a possible treatment for the COVID-19, right? But later with clinical trial, we understood that it was not the case. And you can see clearly the rise and fall of the interest of the community around this hydroxychloroquine, right? It's clearly here. Later on, you can see there is a spike, right? But there is also some role three, right? You see these bars. So this means that, yeah, there exists some, some interest later on, or not of the same magnitude as before, but it's something that is most related to, you know, to the periphery, to, to the network. 
Another amazing story that we get is this machine learning. I mean, machine learning for, for this data set, only for this data set, was not a thing at the beginning. You see, it was really relegated to the periphery. At some point, suddenly, between May and June, it was clear that, you know, you have to cope with this machine learning because the, the amount of data that we got that got published over time is exponentially growing, right? So you have to, you have to deal with machine learning techniques in this, in this field. And so we can see that there is a clear trend that is moving this machine learning topic from the periphery toward the center, center right? And I can also give you something, I mean, some other detail. If you, if you look at that, there is some red bar here that is virtually disappearing, right? Up between February and March 2021, right? This is suggesting us that, you know, uh, probably the, the community was, was, was thinking about this machine learning technique at the beginning, at least, like, you know, something useful, a useful tool that you, that you may, that may be helpful to deal with the data. But later on, you know, it looks like that it was clear to anybody that machine learning, machine learning techniques is something that you need to have in your tool belt if you want to do some relevant research about the topic, right? And this is, again, written within the, the bars, right? And there is a story in, the, in these bars. Now, what we did so far is to actually, you know, put a blind threshold with no, I mean, a user intervention at all. If you want to guide a bit uh, the results, what we can do is do this neighborhood analysis. It's really, really simple. What we did is to select one topic, one keyword, let's say our subtopic, and look only at its surrounding, right? Then we can keep all the co-occurring nodes and sort it by relevance and compute these um, like top 20 charts and see how these top 20 charts evolve over time, right? And we did that. <clears throat> Really, we did that for these two uh, keywords that are SARS-CoV-2 and COVID-19. Now, SARS-CoV-2 is the virus. COVID-19 is the disease caused by the virus, right? If you look at the, you know, uh, um, uh, the graph that you get, uh, if you center these two nodes, you know, the neighborhood of these two nodes is very similar. We have a 95% of overlapping. So we didn't expect any differences, you know, in this analysis uh, with these two topics, but, but if we look at the uh, term that most frequently happened to be in this top 20 list, uh, we got some surprise. We get for the virus, we get serology, vaccine, spike protein, ACE2, that are really uh, connected to the biological function of the virus and that you can detect it. If you move slightly toward the disease, we start to have something different like, you know, public health, epidemiology, mental health, telemedicine, there was not here. Right? And they are mostly related to the treatment uh, and the impact that the disease has on the public, uh, on the general public, right? And this is kind of a remarkable result, uh, I think, because we basically did nothing. And we start by literally some two um, starting point that was very similar, almost overlapping, right? This means that, you know, the, 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 the analysis is working, is, up, is able to detect nuances, right? Uh, that's uh, starting from something that is almost not um, uh, distinguishable, right, by 95% of overlapping. Now, this temporal analysis don't have to be, I mean, relegated to this um, um, use case. There are many other use cases in which this type of temporal analysis can be, can be very useful. In the example I gave you before, uh, you know about the, co the workplace interaction. If you are a huge corporation, you can use the temporal analysis to actually keep track of your key people or to detect employees that need to, to be helped to develop their career, for example, because they are stuck in their role, for example, right? Something slightly more interesting and relevant maybe, it's if you have a criminal or terrorist network, you really want to use this temporal analysis to identify people when they start to play one type of role, right? And so you can have a closer look on them as soon as this happens, right? You know what I mean? Okay, so it can be used also for, for e-commerce to prevent scummy behavior, for example. Suppose that you have um, some of your loyal users that uh, are selling their account to scammers, right? 
uh, you will detect immediately. It happens, right? It can, you, de you will detect it immediately uh, because they will move, will change the role suddenly because of this new behavior. Or in general, you can analyze your customer behaviors, right? I mean, every time, uh, I think that every time we get human behavior that is capturing in your graph, no matter what, uh, it's spilling to your graph and you have some temporal aspect. This temporal analysis, role-based temporal analysis has proved to be a very useful, uh, extremely, I mean, useful tool to get, uh, you know, uh, to, um, to understand what, what, what is going on into, into your graph. Yeah, and that's it. That's it. Thank you. I don't know if we have time for questions, but definitely. Sorry, Fabio, I was too quick uh, clicking that button. Uh, thank you very much uh, for for your your presentation. Uh, we have uh, time for one question, maybe sure. uh, from uh, from Prasnat here. Uh, how are the individual graph snapshots stored? Is the entire graph at any instant of time dumped and then reread to compute the various metrics? Uh, yeah, we did something like that. We have this the world graph uh, storing new for J, and we when we compute the snapshots. Uh, we uh, we take all this uh, this uh, knowledge graph and we put that out of the Neo4j. We use network X, for example, to compute RefX or Rolex algorithm, and then we store back the roles into into the knowledge graph. So we get back and forth for it. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Um, and uh, from Matthew, maybe we do this quickly. How can we contact uh, get more information? Uh, um, from you, maybe I'll, I'll, I'll put this back on here. Um, so this Definitely. is uh, probably yeah, the yeah, best yeah. way to do it. Uh, you can email Fabio, you can uh, re reach out to Fabio on LinkedIn, uh, and obviously, I guess, graphaway.com. Yeah, <clears throat> definitely. I would love to, to hear about you, really. All right, cool. Thank you very much, Fabio, uh, uh, for your time and for your great presentation. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.